You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. In the scenic college town of Stellenbosch, South Africa, Wednesday, March 16, 2005, was the same as any other early autumn day. Leaves on giant oak trees lining the streets were changing color, and things were winding down with Easter being only two weeks away. Stellenbosch is a 40-minute drive from South Africa's top tourist destination, Cape Town. It is one of the most idyllic places to go to university. A vibrant student town, grounded in Cape Dutch colonial history and surrounded by mountains and vineyards. The afternoon was peaceful and warm. Students rode their bicycles to lecture halls. Tourist groups mulled their way around town, planning wine-tasting excursions to all the nearby vineyards. That evening, the apartment of Inga Lutz was engulfed in silence. The only sound was the occasional ping of a text message being received on her cell phone. Later on, the text messages turned into countless concerned phone calls, and they all went unanswered. Her loved ones knew something had to be terribly wrong. Inga's boyfriend, Fred Vanderpfeiffer, was at his apartment, a 30-minute drive away. He was very concerned about the radio silence from Inga and called a friend who lived closer to Inga and asked him to check on her as Fred was already on his way. When that friend, Christo Pretorius, pressed the buzzer at the security gate to Inga's apartment building and there was no answer, he called out to a neighbor of Inga's standing on the balcony to open the gate. With trepidation, Christo opened the door which was closed yet unlocked. He went inside and called her name. From the front door, he could see into the living room. On her couch, Inga still looked to be seated upright. There was a copious amount of blood covering her head and face, and she was almost unrecognizable. At first he thought she'd committed suicide, but Inga had been bludgeoned to death. Christo alerted the police, and what followed was one of the most controversial cases in South African police history. Inga Lotz was the daughter of Jan and Juanita Lotz. Jan was an esteemed professor of radiology at the University of Stellenbosch and Juanita a physiotherapist. They tried for 10 years to fall pregnant and when Inga was eventually born, Juanita stopped working to care for their baby. Little Inga was long awaited and greatly adored. Proud parents Jan and Juanita, having Inga was more than enough. They did not feel the need to have any more kids. They felt blessed and thankful to have such a beautiful little girl. Inga excelled at school, making it to the top four academic achievers in her home province, Western Cape. She was musically talented and played various instruments. When she was selected to sing in a prestigious children's choir, she jumped at the opportunity. Always supportive, both her parents joined the choir on a tour of Europe. Those were happy times, Inga's teenage years. The family home in the affluent neighborhood of Velgamud was adorned with photos of the beautiful Inga. She enjoyed spending time with her parents at their beach house, a four-hour drive east from their home. Then there was the trip to Spain, France, and Euro Disney. The three of them were close and supportive and always loved to be in each other's company. When the time came for Inga to go to university, she decided to study mathematics. As expected, she was a very strong student. After completing her bachelor's degree, she continued to study, and in 2005, Inga was well on her way to acing her master's degree in mathematical statistics. The future seemed bright for this post-grad student. She was bright and gorgeous and had the world at her feet. She had many admirers that would swoon when she gave a warm, dimpled smile. 
There was also more to Inga. She was a devoted Christian who lived her life with virtue, with kindness, and with love. She would always be there if any of her friends needed her. In 2004, Inga met a young actuarial science student called Fred Vanderpfeiffer. Fred grew up on a lucrative tomato and cattle farm in the Eastern Cape and attended the prestigious boarding school Gray College. He wasn't only strong academically, but was quite the sportsman too, playing rugby, cricket, and tennis. Tall, dark, and handsome, Fred caught Inga's attention. The two started dating and soon became very close. Inga's parents not only approved of the relationship, they loved Fred and took him in as part of their family. After completing his postgraduate degree, Fred was still taking some courses at the university while starting his career. He had a promising job, working as an actuary at Old Mutual, a prominent South African investment and insurance company. He moved into an apartment close to his work with a guy named Marius Bota. Marius had also studied with Fred and Inga. At the end of February 2005, Inga moved into her own apartment in a security complex called Shiraz on the outskirts of Stellenbosch. It was a new development with some units still under construction. The apartment was a short 30-minute drive from her parents' own home in Velgamud, so she still spent a lot of time at home. Inga was very close to her mother. Every morning, she would give her mom a missed call, a signal to let her know that she was safe. With the high crime rate in South Africa, it is common practice for loved ones to check in and let someone know that they are indeed safe. Usually, after receiving the daily missed call from Inga, her mom would call her back and they would discuss the day. Every weekend, Inga would go home, always remembering to take a bunch of flowers for her mom. And the weekend of March 11, 2005 was no exception. Inga arrived home on the Friday afternoon and went for a swim in the pool at her family home with her dog jumping in to join her. After the swim, Inga changed into shorts and a tank top and had a cup of tea with her mom. Her mom noticed some bruises on Inga and asked her about it. Inga simply shrugged it off but went to her room and changed into jeans and a sleeved t-shirt instead so as to conceal the bruises. On Sunday morning, Fred called and asked if he could come around to see Inga. But for some or other reason, she did not seem too keen. In the afternoon, her mother remembers he showed up anyway. Inga and Fred were in her room as Inga was packing clothes for the week. She asked her mom about the weather forecast. Her mom said it would be very hot and suggested Inga packed a spaghetti strap, short sundress, to which Fred said, You are only to wear this dress when I'm with you. Inga and her mom laughed. Fred did not. Religion played a huge role in Fred and Inga's relationship. Inga was brought up to be a devoted Christian and still attended her family church with her parents. Fred was a member of the far more conservative His People Church. This church is opposed to any physical contact in premarital relationships, as it might lead to sex. Fred and Inga did not have an intimate relationship, and he believed that she was still a virgin. When you and Nita Lot said goodbye to her Inga that Sunday night, she would never have thought that this would be the last time she would ever see her daughter alive. When she greeted Fred, she said the same thing as she always said to him. Take good care of her. She's all we have. On Tuesday night, Fred went to Inga's apartment with the intention to stay the night. He had lecture to attend early the next morning, and Inga's place was closer to campus than his own place. Fred's family received news that night that his brother Davi's wife was pregnant. When Fred called to congratulate his brother, the two had a disagreement. This wasn't unusual. Friction between Fred and his two older brothers started in December of the year before at his brother Davi's wedding. Fred reprimanded their other brother, Alphonse, for having had too much to drink and for being too rowdy. Both brothers felt that Fred was judgmental and out of line. It was a celebration and no one else took offense to the inebriated brother of the groom. In the course of his evening with Inga, Fred was grumpy about his phone call to Davi, but he didn't want to discuss it with her. He had a shower and went to sleep on the sofa while Inga was still working on her computer. Wednesday morning, March 16th, Inga and Fred had breakfast together and a huge argument broke out. Inga felt that something was up with Fred. He was still grumpy and irritable. 
she had asked him if it had anything to do with their relationship. And at first, Fred did not want to talk about it. But eventually, he admitted that it was the argument with his older brother that had unsettled him. Inga didn't buy it. She started crying and asked him if he still loved her. Fred assured her that he did, but felt that she was the one that was uncertain about their relationship. Inga replied that she still loved him. Fred suggested she wrote down her feelings in a letter or an email so they could discuss it later. He had to leave to attend a lecture, and at 7.45 a.m., Fred left and things were still quite murky between them. While he was at his lecture, Inga wrote Fred a two-page letter. At 9.40 a.m., she sent him a text message saying that she was on her way to campus to give him the letter. A tiling contractor knocked on Inga's door around this time to arrange the repair of two broken tiles on her balcony, but Inga had to go and asked if he could return later. When Fred came out of his lecture hall on campus at 10 a.m., Inga was waiting for him. She gave him the letter in an envelope, and then the two parted ways. Fred went to a furniture store in Stellenbosch to collect a kitchen cupboard for his friend Jean Minar. He loaded the cupboard into the back of his small pickup before leaving for work. Just after 11 a.m., he arrived at his work in Mutual Park in Pinelands, about 29 miles or 47 kilometers from Stellenbosch. Back in Stellenbosch, Inga attended a lecture and met her childhood friend, Vimpy Boschoff, for an early lunch. In her conversation with Vimpy, she told him that she felt it was over between her and Fred after what she described to be a hell of a fight in the morning. Fred suggested she thought about the relationship and whether it should continue or not. Vimpy would be the last of Inga's friends to see her alive. Throughout that day, text messages were flying to and fro between Inga and Fred. Just after 1 p.m., Fred sent Inga a text message using his work computer logged into a cell phone provider's online platform. Hey, I'm glad your lecture went well, and I hope it was nice catching up with Vimpy too. Over lunch, I read your letter. Thank you very much. I will look at it again tonight when I have more time. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great afternoon too. Love you, my angel. F. Kiss kiss. The last text Fred received from Inga was at 1.36 p.m. It read, Had a great time with Vimpy. Tiling done. Miss you already. Kiss kiss. Then Fred went into a meeting with at least six other people for the remainder of the afternoon. Shortly after this text, Inga informed her mom that the tiling on her balcony was complete. Her mom wanted to come around and have a look to see if the job was properly done, but Inga told her it was not necessary. At 2.55 p.m., a receipt shows that Inga bought herself a burger from a burger chain called Steers and then went to an adjacent grocery store to buy a magazine and a soda. Straight from there, she walked to a DVD rental store called The Video Place from where she rented the Stepford Wives at 3.07 p.m. If Inga went straight home after renting the DVD, she would have been at her apartment before 3.30, as it was only a half a mile or a five kilometer drive. No one had any reciprocal contact with Inga after this time. At work, Fred logged back into his computer at 5.15 p.m., read some emails, and left the office at 6.07 p.m. He drove to his own apartment, which he shared with flatmate Marius Bota. Marius was home, and the two watched TV and had dinner. After dinner, Fred left with Marius to drop off the kitchen cupboard he had collected for Jean Minar from a furniture store that morning. He stayed for a cup of coffee with his friend's flatmate, who... Incidentally, it was Inga's ex-boyfriend, Brom Kruger. Shortly after 8 p.m., Fred sent Inga a text message saying that he loved her and that he'd call her a bit later for a chat and to hear her voice. She did not respond to his text message. He tried to call her at 9 p.m., and then again three minutes later, she still didn't answer. Fred felt that this was unusual, but considering their fight that morning and the way things were between them, he assumed she didn't want to talk to him. Still, he felt uneasy and sent another text around 9.40 p.m. asking if she was okay and saying that she could give him a missed call and that he'd call her back. 20 minutes later, at 10 p.m., Fred sent a polite text to Inga's mom, which said that he couldn't get a hold of Inga. He asked if her mom had heard from her as he was starting to feel uneasy. Ewanita Lotz replied that she hadn't heard from her daughter at all. 
At 10.08 p.m. that night, Fred tried to call Inga once more. Again, his call went unanswered. His flatmate Marius, who was aware of the situation, suggested that they call one of his friends, Christo Pretorius, who lived closer to Inga, to investigate. Around 10.30 p.m., Fred left his place to go to the Lotz family home. He said that he would pick up spare keys to Inga's complex so he could do a welfare check on her. The locks at Inga's apartment were changed the previous day, along with all the other apartments in the complex. It was to rectify a mistake made by a subcontractor. So on Wednesday night, neither Fred nor Inga's parents had the keys to get into Inga's apartment. But if Fred could at least gain access into the complex, then he could take it from there. At 10.35, Christo Pretorius found Inga Lotz's bludgeoned body in her apartment. He immediately alerted law enforcement and also called Fred's flatmate Marius to break the news. Around the same time, Fred arrived at the Lotz home in Velgamud. After collecting the remote control for Inga's gate, he started to make his way to Stellenbosch. As he was driving, he called Marius to hear if there was any news from Christo. Marius was already in his car on his way to the Lotz family home, but did not want to break the bad news over the phone and ended the call. A couple of minutes later, Fred called Marius again and pushed him for an answer. He said he could sense something was wrong and that Marius shouldn't lie to him. Marius asked Fred to meet him at Inga's parents' home. After this, Fred called his own mother and said he was on his way to Stellenbosch as something was terribly wrong with Inga. He asked his parents to pray as he did not know what was going on. When Marius arrived at the Lot's home, Inga's mom was in the driveway and Fred was sitting in his car, which was parked on the side of the road. Fred's actions at this moment would become a great source of contention. In Fred's initial statement to police, he said that he turned around at an intersection near Stellenbosch, but later changed his statement and claimed that he had turned around at an intersection not far from the Lot's home. He also said that he had gone into the Lot's home to wait for Marius and prayed with Inga's mom. But Inga's mother's version of events is quite different to Fred's. According to Yuanita Lotz, she tried to call Fred at 10.50 p.m. and that he did not answer. She then went outside to wait for Marius and saw Fred sitting in his car, eyes closed. Before she could ask him what he was doing, Marius arrived and gave the news that no parent would ever want to hear. Inga had died. Varying accounts of how Fred and Yuanita Lotz were told about Inga's death was just the beginning of a long journey in search of the real truth about the events of March 16, 2005. Inga was always well presented, punctual and precise. But the day she died, everything had come undone. From the various investigations, both by police and private investigators, to witness accounts, the hunt of her murderer that followed Inga's death brought with it unimaginable pain, frustration, and what seems to be endless contradiction. In the days after Inga's death, Fred had moved into the Lot's home, sleeping on the floor in Inga's bedroom, lighting candles like some kind of shrine. Family from across the country went to Stellenbosch to support both the Lots and the van der Pfeiffer families. Inga was related to South African swimming champion, Olympian, Rick Needling. In a public statement to South African national newspaper, the Sunday Times, Needling said that his cousin Inga was an amazing girl with tremendous potential and a lot of love. The family planned Inga's funeral for March 22nd with assistance from their church. The night before this sad event, Yuanita Lotz sent a text message to Fred which read, Thank you for all your love, Fred. Our hearts have been broken by our angel child. Love you. Sleep well. As could be expected, Inga Lotz's funeral was extremely emotional. Her childhood friend, Vimpy Boshoff, gave a five-minute eulogy, which paints a picture of Inga in God's kingdom, being God's statistician and singing in a choir of angels. Fred also had a chance to speak and started by quoting a poem on behalf of Inga's parents. Then he proceeded to read from a letter he had written to Inga. He described Inga as a petite girl with integrity, and to Fred, as a child of God, Inga embodied Jesus to him. She had brought Fred closer to Jesus. She did what she had to do. It was enough. The pallbearers were all the significant young men in Inga's life. Fred Vanderpfeiffer, best friend Vimpy Boshoff, 
ex-boyfriend Bram Kruger and friends Marius Botta, Jean Menard, and Daniel Griffenberg. After the funeral, Fred was asked to move out of Inga's childhood room and out of the lot's home. In the days leading up to the funeral, some of Fred's actions did not sit well with Inga's parents. On the night of Inga's death, Fred told Juanita Lotz about the letter Inga had given him earlier that day. When Juanita asked to see it, he gave another, shorter note instead, which we will be discussing shortly. Also, when it was time to formally identify Inga's body, her parents could not face the grim task and asked Juanita's brother, Inga's uncle and godparent, to do it. When he was on his way to the morgue, he received a phone call from Fred instructing him to turn around as Fred had already asked two of the pastors from his church to identify the body. Ian ignored the call, and after a short confrontation at the morgue, the two pastors left. When Inga's dad, Jan Lotz, heard about this, he was furious. Fred had overstepped a very sacred boundary, and the Lotz family was starting to lose their taste for him. The issue with the two letters also made them feel uneasy. Why would Fred hide the letter Inga gave to him? The letter that Fred showed Inga's parents was a short note that read, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate how special you are. Thank you for your love, support, and kind heart, and that you are always prepared to listen to my little problems. I love you very, very, very much. Good luck with your day and your week, and know that Jesus is always with you. Love and kisses, Inga. The Lots immediately felt that this note was not written that morning. Why would she say good luck with your week and not good luck with the rest of your week, on a Wednesday? Fred later admitted that the note was in the envelope with another longer letter. He had kept the longer letter from Inga's parents because there was sensitive information about the Lotz family and he did not want to upset them. He also felt that the long letter was a personal letter between boyfriend and girlfriend and did not concern her parents. So let's look at the content of this two-page letter Inga wrote on the morning of her death that she had given to Fred reportedly the last time he ever saw her alive. In the long letter, she alludes to their fight that morning and that it got out of control. It is clear that Fred had questioned Inga's commitment to their relationship. She promises that by the grace of God, she would always be faithful to him and that she would always be honest with him. She wrote that she would never cheat on him, then crossed that sentence out. The edited version reads, she would never do anything behind his back and this brings the question, was there an issue of fidelity here? Did Fred think Inga was cheating on him? Inga had many male friends. Her closest friends thought that most of them were in love with her. Even Fred's own flatmate, Marius Bota, had feelings for her and had once said that he did not think Inga and Fred were good for each other. He had written her love letters and poems. In fact, it would later come out that Fred was jealous when he heard that Marius and Inga had kissed. A couple of weeks before her death, Inga met a male friend called Rudy for lunch. After lunch, she sent a text saying, Hi Rudy, thanks for the coffee, I enjoyed it a lot. Love Inga. The message had inadvertently been sent to Fred, and Inga hastily followed up with another text to Fred. I told Rudy about you today, so it was pure friendship, love. In her letter, Inga tried to appease Fred, and it's clear she wanted to patch things up. In fact, she mentioned that she would like to spend the rest of her life with him. He had enriched her life in so many ways, and time spent with him was the greatest gift anyone could dream of. She also asked him to show her how to be the perfect girlfriend for him, although she wasn't hopeful of ever being as perfect as him. She makes a reference to the upcoming Easter weekend and that she feared how we would perceive her father's drinking. She said, I don't want to lose you in such a way, and I don't want you to see that side of my family. After Fred's blow up with his brother about drinking too much, it is understandable that Inga was apprehensive about alcohol use in Fred's presence. But remember, the Cape region is wine country. Some of the world's best wines are served with lunch and or dinner in most households. When the letter became public, Jan Lotz commented, It is not like the Inga we knew. She was afraid. Her writing reflects total submission. I suggest you ask Fred if he has ever seen me drink too much. My child was raised in a house where red wine is considered part of our culture. There was seldom any other type of alcohol in the house. 
On the morning of her death, is it suddenly an issue? Whose standards are these? Standards she was raised with or standards of his people's church? The fact that Fred initially kept this letter from Inga's parents raised suspicion. And then his admission that she had given both the letter and the note to him in the same envelope? It did not make any sense. The longer letter was written on A4 sized paper, like sheets from a legal pad. The shorter one was written on watermarked stationery. The handwriting also differed quite a bit, which shows that she was in different emotional states when writing these two letters. Handwriting experts believe it is not plausible that Inga wrote both letters at the same time on the morning of her death. In fact, the handwriting is so different, one can wonder if Inga had written both at all. The community was outraged about Inga's brutal murder and there was a lot of pressure on police to solve the case. But incompetence made Inga Latza's murder one of the most botched investigations by South African police in recent times. Police have been accused of losing, compromising, and even fabricating evidence. On the night of Inga's murder, there were at least seven officers in her apartment, trampling all over the scene. When forensic technicians arrived, they secured what they could, but this was only the beginning of the red tape controversies that ensued. The crime scene showed no indication of a struggle. Inga was found still sitting up, legs half crossed, and a magazine on her lap reading an article featuring one of her friends who was a contestant in a cover girl competition. Inga did not see her attack coming. She received multiple blows to her head and one to her hand, showing that she tried to defend herself. She also had stab wounds in her neck and chest made by a sharper object like a knife. The stab wounds were inflicted after she had died. In total, Inga Lutz had 47 wounds on her small, defenseless body. There were no signs of forced entry and nothing was stolen. The keys to her Volkswagen and cell phone were on the kitchen bench top. This was not a burglary. The only missing items were a kitchen knife and the remote control for the gate of the security complex, which was needed for entry and exit. Police felt from the start that the crime was committed by someone Inga knew well. The only way anyone could have been inside her apartment is if she had let them in. She was also dressed in pajama shorts and a tank top, and being rather conservative, she would not have been comfortable in front of anyone dressed like this. It must have been someone she felt at ease with, and the explosive violence of the murder was personal. It was seen as a crime of passion by someone who had personal anger towards Inga in that moment. After the brutal attack, the perpetrator went to the bathroom and cleaned up. A bloody towel was found on the bathroom floor next to two blood marks. The marks looked like it could be a partial shoe print, but there were no other bloody shoe prints anywhere else in the apartment or leading away from it. On the coffee table in front of the couch was the generic DVD cover from the video rental shop. Police lifted some fingerprints, most of which remained unidentified, which was not strange since it was a generic cover which had been handled by numerous people working in the DVD store and other customers who had rented DVDs but at least this was a starting point. Inga's autopsy confirmed that she wasn't raped. An examination of her head wounds concluded that the possible murder weapon was a blunt object, like a hammer. Police canvassed the neighborhood and looked into recent break-ins in the area. In the six months leading up to the murder, there were a total of seven other break-ins. Remember that South Africa does have a high crime rate, so this is not unusual. But there was a pattern of the other break-ins no one was ever home. Objective was always to take electronics or other valuables. Yet in Inga's flat, her cell phone, her laptop computer, and television set were untouched. Nothing was taken. About two weeks after the attack, a 17-year-old known criminal and meth addict called Werner Carolus confessed that he had killed Inga. Then he had changed his statement and said he had witnessed the murder committed by a friend of his. Carolus claimed that they had killed a young woman who regularly bought drugs from them on a Saturday night. He stood outside to keep watch and then saw his friends fleeing the scene. He then looked through the window and saw Inga on the couch, blood dripping from her arm. This account didn't make any sense. Firstly, Inga was not a drug user. She was also killed on a Wednesday, not a Saturday. And at the crime scene, bloody as it was, there was no blood dripping from Inga's arm. When police took Carolus to Inga's neighborhood, he pointed out Shiraz, the complex where Inga lived, 
but could not say where in the complex her apartment was. Eventually, Carolus retracted his confession, saying that it was all fabricated. Carolus's fingerprints matched burglaries committed in Stellenbosch on the 12th and 20th of March, a couple of days before and after Inga's murder. He was convicted and sent to prison for 11 years. At this time, they were looking at the suspect as someone with a motive to kill Inga, a jealous man with unrequited love for Inga. Police had excluded Mary Espota, Fred van der Pfeiffer's flatmate, as a suspect. Then the results came back from fingerprint analysis. On the generic DVD cover on Inga's coffee table, there was a print matching that of her boyfriend, Fred van der Pfeiffer, which placed him at the scene after she had taken the DVD out at 3.07 p.m. when Fred claimed to be at work. A search of his apartment yielded a sports shoe, which fitted the blood mark on the bathroom floor at the crime scene. The high-tech brand sneakers had recently been washed. When Fred was asked if he owned a hammer, he remembered an ornamental hammer slash bottle opener given to him for Christmas by Inga's parents. The silver handle was engraved with the words Fred 2004. The hammer was in Fred's car behind the driver's seat. It had shifted underneath his seat and he claimed that he had forgotten about it. In June, two months after Inga Lutz was murdered, police were gearing up to arrest her boyfriend, Fred van der Pfeiffer, for her murder. On the advice of his lawyers, Fred went to the Clutusville police station and gave himself up, still professing his innocence. He requested to take a polygraph, which he passed. It showed no signs of deception on his part. Prosecution felt, however, that their case against Fred was strong enough. They were gathering evidence and witness statements to present at trial. From the onset, it looked like they had their guy. The last witnesses that saw Inga were construction workers who were building inside Shiraz complex. However, as prosecution was preparing statements for trial, they learned that the construction company QuickCon Construction had been liquidated and the temporary employees who had worked illegally had returned to Mozambique and could not be tracked down. That includes the person who tiled the balcony at Inga's apartment on the day of her death, possibly the very last person to have seen Inga alive. Two years after Inga's murder, the trial against Fred van der Pfeiffer kicked off in the Cape High Court. The South African judicial system does not include trial by jury. The case is presented and defended in court and presided over by one judge. To honor Inga, her mother, Yuanita Lotz, wore brightly colored scarves whenever she attended court. The trial was to become a nine-month battle, with stories of incest, cannibalism, drug use and infidelity, making the case quite absurd at times. Many international expert witnesses were called to testify. Judge Dion Van Ziel had quite a task to sift through all this information, which were at times proven, disproven, contradicted, and even fabricated. The first piece of evidence was the fingerprint on the DVD cover, which placed Fred at the crime scene after 3 p.m. An American fingerprint expert examined the evidence and concluded that the print in question came from a curved surface like a glass, not a flat surface like a DVD case. That means that evidence was labeled wrongly. In police documentation, the fingerprint was labeled 10.15 a.m. the following day, thus not marked at the scene when it was taken late on Wednesday night, March the 16th. Having Fred's fingerprints on a glass would be normal, as he had spent a lot of time at the flat, also the night before the murder. To add insult to injury, police returned the DVD cover to the video place where Inga had rented the movie from, sacrificing a crucial, arguably the most crucial piece of evidence in this case. The media crucified police. In the struggle to comprehend why so many mistakes were made, accusations of a cover-up was made. But why would police lie or plant evidence? There was no way they could have known about the story of Fred's fight with Inga in the morning and that he would turn out to be a suspect. Fred's defense team had to accept that there was no cover-up, but that inexperienced officers were sent to the scene, officers that should never have been tasked with solving such a brutal murder. There was also the fact that Fred had an ironclad alibi for the afternoon of Inga's murder. He was at work from 11 a.m. till 6 p.m. at Mutual Park in Pinelands. This was 29 miles or 47 kilometers away from Inga's apartment. He did not leave the building during the day. CCTV footage captured when he arrived and when he left through turnstiles in the main lobby. 
He was in a meeting with at least seven colleagues for the whole afternoon, seated next to his boss. All of those colleagues gave sworn statements confirming that he was there. However, there was no electronic evidence placing him at work for the 105 minutes between 329 and 514. That means he could have left the building unseen, walked five minutes to his car, driven the 40 minutes, spent 15 minutes bludgeoning his girlfriend and cleaning up before making the 40 minute journey back to work and walking the five minutes back from his car into the building without being seen by any security cameras. All of this wearing the same clothes and acting normal. Judge Van Ziel did not think this was plausible or even possible. Fred's behavior on the evening of Inga's death was also put under the microscope. Cell phone records indicate that after he had collected the remote control from Inga's mom in Velgamud, he turned the car around and parked down the street from the lot's home. Conflicting statements about exactly where he had turned around made it look like he was trying to hide something. Fred's accusers felt that he already knew Inga was dead and that he never intended to drive to Stellenbosch to go and check on her. He waited near her parents' home as events that he set in motion unfolded. Fred's supporters would argue that he was in shock and sensed something tragic had happened. Instead of speeding to Inga's apartment to come to her aid, he was paralyzed with fear and uncertainty. As for the murder weapon, Inga's DNA was not found on Fred's ornamental hammer. The shape of the head wounds also did not quite fit the shape of the hammer. Defense argued that the wounds were larger than the shape of the ornamental hammer and that the victim could have possibly been pistol whipped. Then there was the shoe print evidence. South African police investigator, Superintendent Bruce Bartholomew, stated to the court that ex-FBI Bill Bodziak, who literally wrote the textbook on blood evidence and shoe prints and testified in the O.J. Simpson case in the 1990s, confirmed that the blood mark in the bathroom was made by Fred's shoe. When Bodziak heard about this, he was furious. Bartholomew had lied about Bodziak's findings. So Bill Bodziak was called as an expert witness by Fred's defense team. He testified that the blood mark in the bathroom was definitely not Fred's shoe print. In fact, was not a shoe print at all. It was a blood transfer mark from a bloodied object being placed on the floor. During his final comments, Judge Dion Van Ziel said he had never experienced such a lack of discipline of police at a crime scene. He was sympathetic to Inga's loved ones, stating it is normal in a case where a beautiful gifted young lady is murdered for the community to want someone to be held accountable. However, the court could only come to a conclusion based on the evidence presented. In November 2007, Fred Vanderpfeiffer was acquitted of murder of Inga Lotz in the Cape High Court. He can never be charged with Inga's murder again. Years after this trial, Judge Venziel said he felt prosecution were focused only on the suspect and not on the case and the evidence. They were underprepared for the onslaught delivered by Fred's defense team. Private investigators hired by the Vanderpfeiffer family pointed a finger to Inga's uncle, Ian Myber, Juanita's brother. They believed he had killed Inga. This was based on Myberg's ex who said that he had phoned her at 9 p.m. on the night of the murder to tell her that Inga had died, when Inga's body was only discovered later. Cell phone records refuted this, showing the call was made after midnight. It also shows that Myberg was in Pretoria, over 900 miles or 1,500 kilometers away on the night in question, according to Fred's defense team. Ian Myberg's ex also stated that she had once walked in on Myberg and Inga and found them in a compromising position. When Myberg's ex heard about this, she took a sworn statement, saying she had never said anything of the sort, and that the private investigators were using her name to further their lies. Private investigators also looked up Werner Carolus, the meth addict who said he had witnessed Inga's death. Carolus recanted all his previous statements and said he had witnessed a Caucasian male bite a piece of flesh from Inga's chest. He had lied about events before saying his friends had killed Inga because he wanted to get back at them for a drug deal gone bad. Also, he would rather be in prison than face the crazed cannibal which he saw killing Inga. But Carolus isn't the most credible witness and his statements did not carry any weight. Fred's defense attorney used a shopping list made by Inga early in December before her death to claim that she had had an abortion. On the list were mundane items like cheese, antihistamine, shampoo, and then the abbreviation DNC, which they argued was code for dilation and curatage, the process of abortion. In all fairness, 
It was probably the initials for Davi and Carla, Fred's brother and fiance whose wedding she attended later within December. Their initials were to remind her to buy a wedding gift. The next entry on the list, silver shoes, which she wore to the wedding, indicates that the wedding was on her mind. As in any high-profile crime, the rumor mill was churning. There was talk that many of Fred and Inga's male friends were part of a secret group of friends who called themselves the Wolverines. The group consisted only of men who flirted with each other, using explicit sexual references and soft gay pornography. There was no evidence that Fred was ever part of this group, but he did know all the members well. A rumor started doing the rounds that Inga wasn't Jan's daughter, but that Juanita's brother, Ian Myberg, was her father. These rumors were unfounded and ridiculous, and Inga's family felt like facing all of these untruths was like having to bury Inga twice. The Lotz family could not accept the court's decision to acquit Fred and brought a civil case against him, suing him for 8 million rand, or $650,000, in damages. But the strain of legal procedures and the stress of dealing with his daughter's death were taking its toll on Jan Lotz's health and well-being, and together with his wife, Juanita, decided to withdraw the lawsuit in May 2009. In 2010, Fred Vanderpfeiffer won a 46 million rand, or close to $4 million, civil case against the South African police service for what he claimed to be malicious prosecution. In 2013, this ruling was overturned in the Supreme Court of Appeal after appeal by the police. Fred subsequently took the matter to Constitutional Court, which declined his request to take the matter any further. In March 2012, Interest in the case flared up again when Inga's parents offered a 1 million rand or about $80,000 reward for information that could lead to solving her murder. Jan Lotz asked for a retired professor of physics, Kobus Visser, to re-examine the controversial fingerprint in July of 2013. He used conic section, a mathematical calculation to determine whether the fingerprint was lifted off a flat or a curved surface. The conclusion was that it was lifted from a flat surface and not a curved one as experts had testified. This would mean that Fred had indeed touched the DVD cover after Inga had rented it, placing him at the scene of the crime. Now Jan Lotz wants answers. Various books have been written about Inga's murder. Fruit of a Poison Tree by Anthony Altbecker explores the fact that police honed in on Fred too early in the investigation and compromised evidence to suit their theory. Bloody Lies and Bloody Lies 2 were written by the Mullet brothers, Calvin and Thomas, who took a personal interest in the case and reevaluated all forensic evidence, concludes that there could only have been one perpetrator, and that is Fred Vanderpfeiffer. The views of these books are as diverse as the public opinion on the case itself. The million dollar question is, if Fred did not kill Inga, then who did? The investigation is officially closed. But private investigators and forensic experts who were involved in the case have not closed the book yet. Hopefully one day, Jan and Juanita Lotz will know the truth about what happened to their beautiful daughter, Inga, on that fateful autumn day. Fred Vanderpfeiffer completed his studies and works as an actuarial manager, still at Old Mutual. He has married and is an active member of his church. He is no longer in the media spotlight. Inga's father... Professor Jan Lotz said in a recent interview, People tell me I should close the book and get on with my life, but how can I close a book I don't understand? For so many people, the killing of Inga Lotz will remain an open wound until someone is brought to justice. If you'd like to read up more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.